the beauty of the pupil, there is a fact that is not widely known, but it's very unusual. The pupil normally contracts and, and dilates rhythmically. It's known as hippos, I think. Mm -hmm. But when people are engaged in a task, you assign them you know, a multiplication task. Mm -hmm. The pupil dilates, and it stays steady as a rock. Hippos is gone. So the <laughs> measurement noise yeah. is eliminated. And I, I don't know what the mechanism is, yeah. but it's absolutely obvious when you watch it. Yeah. Measurement noise is eliminated when people are engaged yeah. in, a, in a task. So yeah. that, it, <laughs> it is more sensitive than, yeah. than the other autonomic indices. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. So the title of your book is Thinking Fast and Slow, and you talk about two systems, system one and two. Can you give us an example or uh, tell us a bit about uh, the characters in the book? Well, uh, the characters are indeed system one and system two, and system one is... You know, it's, it corresponds to a distinction that everybody recognizes uh, in their own thinking, that there are some thought that just happened to you and there are some thought that you must generate. Uh, there is a lot of, of mental life that is completely effortless and then there is some of mental life that feels like work. And uh, so that distinction is, is obvious and people recognize it. Now, how you label it is, is, turns out to be quite important. So the proper labels would be type one and type two, and there would even be a third type because I'm not sure that effortful reasoning and self-control and inhibition of responses are really exactly the same thing. They're probably distinct. So there are two or three types of responses. It turns out that when learning about types is very difficult and thinking about types is very difficult, but the brain seems to be wired to think about agents. So when you describe the system one and system two and there are agents that do things, people find it easy to understand, it's compelling and interesting and, and system one and system two develop personalities. And so the personality of system one is that, you know, it does everything and it does everything quickly and most of the time it's right. Uh, but what it doesn't recognize, it doesn't recognize its own limitations so that when it encounters an ambiguous situation, it makes a choice. And when it doesn't know the answer to the question, it answers a related question. But it's never stumped, or very rarely stumped, uh, by simple questions. System two is a very, you know, it's a different operation. It gets mobilized. When system one encounters difficulties, so you mentioned the difference between system one uh, as being things that happen to you and system two or things that you do. Can you give us some examples of the two sure. systems? Sure. Uh, so, you know, when I say the word mother, you, uh, you have images probably of your mother and you certainly have an emotional reaction. And that's something that happens to you. When I say two plus two, a number comes to your mind. You didn't bring it there. It just came. It happened to you. So, and there are many, you know, in fact, most of mental life is like that. You know, the words that I utter when I say the sentence, they just come to me, you know, I don't. Uh, sometimes I will stop and choose which word, that system too. But most of the time, you know, when I speak, the words just come. So that's system one. And a system two is, well, there are really two types of operation that system two performs. And one is complex computations, and that is where the pupil dilates, and you know, there's, uh, this is mental work. So mental work uh, is involved in you know, a, a short-term memory task. If I ask you, what, is your, what was your previous telephone number? You'll work, and your pupil will expand by about 30 or 40% of its area as you retrieve this. Uh, then there is self-control the inhibition of uh, impulses. Uh, the, when you are indeed choosing your words carefully because you don't want to offend, or uh, those are situations in which system two is hard at work and you, and you feel it. So it corresponds, system one and system two really correspond to uh, 
experiences that are readily available and that everybody recognizes. So that distinction between something happening and something that you do is, I think, pretty compelling to most people. And the dichotomy that you've drawn between System 1 and 2, um, how does that relate to the previous work you've done on heuristics and biases? Well, it turns out, uh, you know, we had, Emma Tversky and I, when we started our work, we had something in mind that was fairly similar to that. We were interested in intuitive statistics, so in, in you know, the estimates that come to people's minds about probabilities and so on. Now, in many of these cases, uh, we were both teachers of statistics. So we were testing our own intuitions, but we knew that we could compute. So in our very first paper, uh, we distinguish intuition from computation. And, and our point was that intuition is, in some cases, surprisingly error prone, and that people should uh, rely on computation. Uh, this, yeah. Uh, so that's, that was the beginning, but we never studied the, what I now call system two. Then our work became controversial, and people uh, attacked it and criticized it. And there was something that essentially all the criticisms and all the experimental criticisms of our work had in common in that they were created a situation in which people could figure out the answer by working on it. And uh, that was really the background. So Amos Tversky and I, in the very last paper that we wrote together, we answered one of our very persistent and well-known critics, Gerd Gigerenzer, and, um, and we pointed out that uh, in his experiments, typically, uh, people would see, so, well, how would I describe it? One of our most, our best known examples in, in heuristics, and it's one of the best examples in the heuristics literature, is, is uh, the Linda example. So Linda is that young, not so young woman, she's about 30 years old now, and, uh, but I'm telling you that when she was a student, she was an activist, a feminist, marched in all the marches. I didn't say feminist, actually. And then uh, we asked people how likely it is that Linda now is a bank teller, or how likely it is that she is now a bank teller and is active in the feminist movement. Now, there's no question that when you ask different people those two questions, you know, they will invariably say that uh, it's more likely that she's a feminist bank teller rather than a bank teller. Yeah. When you ask them the two questions to compare the two options, you're allowing system two to check logic. And by priming logical reasoning and by creating some you can sensitize people so that they will detect that obviously she is more likely to be a bank teller than a feminist bank teller. But that seems to be a different process. When people see only one example, they evaluate the fit of that example. When you show them two things together, they can also compare them and you provide another cue. And that was really the background to the distinction between the two systems with a controversy around our work. Uh, it was an attempt to resolve that controversy by pointing out if you do it between subjects, in a, you know, if you do it the way the world is, uh, so you make judgments intuitively about things that they happen, you get those effects. And you can make them disappear by uh, allowing logic to, uh, to play. Yeah. Now, um there's been a lot of um, airtime, I suppose, around the, the idea of the 10,000 hours of expertise. Is there anything to that figure of 10,000 hours? I have no idea, really, about the 10,000 hours. I'm, that is, I'm a customer of this. I mean, uh, Ericsson, who has you know, promoted this, uh, this figure, uh, is you know, a highly reputable researcher. But it's a crude approximation, I'm sure. I mean, there's nothing magical about 10,000. 
and I'm sure that it doesn't take the same amount of time to different people and and you know expertise is not wholly defined and so on but so uh, but it's uh, it gives you an idea that this is a lot of hours that to become an expert where you see that qualitative change in in the way things are done where basically performance switches from what I call system two to system one. That takes a long time. How many hours? I'm not committing myself and I don't know. Yeah. One of the goals of the course is to kind of cue people to um, the difference between people who are actual experts and people who simply just claim to be experts. Um, is there anything that people should watch out for? Any red flags to kind of tell the difference between people who actually know or can actually do what oh, they claim? Yeah. I mean, I stuff? think Gary Klein and I wrote a paper in which we actually suggested an answer. It's, it's embarrassingly simple. But when somebody acts self, like a self-confident expert on, on a range of problems, then there's one question to be asked. Did that person have a decent opportunity to learn how to perform the task? Because, and that requires getting feedback on the quality of performance and getting rapid and unequivocal feedback. In the absence of rapid and unequivocal feedback, expertise is just the self-confidence that comes with a lot of experience. And that is uncorrelated with accuracy. This is something we've known for 50 years or more. So if somebody wanted to become an expert, at uh, a new task. What's the fastest and most efficient way to turn, as you said, uh, that system two, that effortful sort of processing into system one? Well, there are really two ways of doing this, and, and you have to use both. You have to use system two. So, you know, for somebody to become an expert driver, you have to tell them how to drive. So. And, and I would say for somebody to, to become an expert diagnostician on the basis of x-rays, you know, uh, you have to teach them you know, what those things look like so that they'll be able to recognize them. But then you need also a lot of practice with high quality feedback. So merely telling people how to do something is not going to turn them into experts. And, and repeatedly telling them the same thing is not going to help. It's a lot of practice with feedback that creates real expertise. But you can, uh, you can abbreviate the time that it takes to reach expertise by having high quality instruction about what cues you should be, you should be paying attention to. Yeah. So actually knowing what it is that discriminates the two categories, if it's yeah. an abnormal scan versus a normal scan and so uh, on. Gary Klein has a beautiful example. Yeah. That, uh, he, he talks of um, a nurse in a cardiac ward who comes home and talks to her father-in-law, as I recall, and says, we have to go to the hospital. Because he doesn't look good to her. And it turns out that, yes, he had to go to the hospital. He is in deep trouble. He needs 12 hours later or something, he is on the operating table. And what she had done, so Gary Klein did what he and others, but I think he is the, the main guru of uh, this type of enterprise. He, he found out where the cues were, although she was not aware of the cues that she was using. But he found out that uh, when arteries are obstructed, getting obstructed, which will lead to a heart attack, uh, there is a pattern, the pattern of distribution of the blood in the face changes. Now, she had recognized, she had learned that pattern, but she didn't know what it was. Now, when you're training nurses, you can show them the pattern. That's clever. Uh, the, the goal of the course, the, the title of the course, is The Science of Everyday Thinking. And what we're trying to do is to provide people with um, the ability to think more clearly, argue better, reason better. Um, I suppose, learn to use system two, to be more analytic, to unpack read more carefully, and so on. Uh, do you have any advice for somebody in the course who's trying to improve their everyday thinking? Well, you know, my, my advice would be quite conservative. I mean, I, it would say, it would be 
pick a few areas and pick a few things where you want to change what you're doing and, and focus on those. I mean, do not expect that you can generally increase the quality of your thinking because I think you really cannot. But, uh, but in, you can, if there are repetitive mistakes that you're prone to make, if you learn the cues, the situations in which you make that mistake, then maybe you can learn to eliminate them. I'm not, you know, the history of success in enterprises like yours is that they're not always successful. I mean, uh, people feel great uh, when, when they hear of all these ways of doing things and of controlling themselves, but then you know, when they're making a mistake, they're so busy making it that they have no time to correct it. I mean, one of the reasons, I think, for my skepticism about this is that I don't think my thinking is very much better than it was, you know, 40 years ago or 45 years ago when I started doing this work. So that, uh, that uh, this suggests some humility. So pick your shots, pick a few areas, and, and then in those situations that you recognize as situations where you're prone to make a mistake, slow yourself down. Yeah. And, and one piece of advice, by the way, is that recognize situations where you can't do it alone, where you need a friend, where you need advice. Uh, because if you do it alone, you're going to make a mistake. Sure. So. so the nature of system two is that it's effort that it's something that you have to do. Now that's hard, and obviously, as, as you mentioned, um, trying to get people to be motivated enough to engage in system two. Well, actually, a lot of people have, <laughs> have the tools and have everything they need in order to make better decisions, in order to learn a new task. Um, but it's just a matter of putting in that cognitive effort to doing a little bit of, of putting in some elbow grease and actually making that happen. Do you have any advice for how to make that cognitive effort seem a little less effortful? No, I'm not sure I know how to make it less effortful. You know, it's going to be effortful. Uh, what you can do is illustrate the costs and benefits of, of investing some effort. There are, by the way, large individual differences. So Keith Stanovich, uh, he is, uh, I don't know if he's in your list. Uh, he's not. He was, he was on the list, but we couldn't catch up. With you couldn't catch him. Yeah. Keith Stanovich has a whole program of research distinguishing between what he calls intelligence and rationality. And rationality is, in effect, the ability to, to deploy system two where it's needed and to uh, interfere with the mistakes that system one is, is apt to produce. And he finds some people are more rational, and, but not, uh, not particularly rational, although they're intelligent or vice versa. That's interesting. I mean, that, that's one of the hardest tasks. I mean, it, just getting people, I mean, they have everything available to them, but it's actually just well, doing we, the thing. Well, you can recognize, you know, I mean, uh, I've worked a lot with anchoring. You know, so that's a phenomenon. So somebody puts a number in your head, and and it looks plausible after a while. I mean, in fact, this is the way our mind works. We hear something strange. We try to make sense of it. Trying to make sense of it, it makes us more prone to believe it. So anchoring is is a suggestion effect that's very powerful. You can recognize when you're being anchored. So you know, if you are in a negotiation situation and the other side, you know, has an outrageous number, you know, there is, you could become anchored and that is worth resisting. So that's an example. Another example is that when you make explicit predictions, you know, like with, with somebody who is uh, a young professor eventually get tenure or not, um, Remind yourself that the base rate of tenure is very important in that, st in that uh, story. 
that is a system two kind of judgment. Uh, so in your book, um, in the beginning, you talked about your relationship with Amos and uh, a very productive and it sounds like an outstanding sort of working relationship. Um, how do you, how could you make that happen as a, as, uh, as a, in a workplace in order to kind of facilitate a better sort of uh, productive environment where ideas come freely and uh, can you kind of describe what that, the nature of that? Well, is? I mean, you know, creating a productive environment is very different from creating exceptional collaborations. But, you know, for the creating a an productive environment, I think there are some recipes and they are really well known. So you've got to get to create many opportunities for people to bump into each other so that they can exchange ideas. You've got to allow ex to encourage exchange of ideas between people who are not in the same field. And you know, Steve Jobs was famous for the suggestion of you know, having very few restrooms in the building to force people from different units to meet each other you know, in, uh, on their way to the restroom or there. Uh, that, you know, that's a recipe that works for encouraging exchange of ideas. Uh, many places in the UK, um, many departments of universities and, and research centers used to have, it's diminishing, they used to have coffee in the morning, tea in the afternoon, which was like 30 minutes where everybody would be in the same room at the same time. I think that's enormously productive. Now, how to get an exceptional collaboration going, I don't think there is any recipe for that. You know, if you're lucky enough, it happens to you, and I was very lucky. Um, so what's next? Uh, this was Matt's uh, question. Um, you've written this book. We know everything about, uh, well, we know a lot more than we did about the differences between System 1 and 2 and that, uh, and that difference and, and in training and so on. What's the next, if you're kind of looking at kind of the landscape of the judgment decision-making field at the moment, um, what do you think is something worth pay, paying attention to? Look, I mean, I'm, I'm very skeptical about forecasting. I think that's very evident in my book. I think people have no idea what the future will be, and, and I'm no exception. So I have really no interesting forecast. I've never tried to forecast the future. There's something that's very obvious that is happening, and this is the tremendous spread of neuroscience in, you know, and, and the merger of psychology and neuroscience. And there you can make a confident prediction because so many very bright young students are going to that field, and so they are betting their careers on it. So you know that for the next 15 years there's going to be a lot of work. In, in neuroscience and decision-making neuroscience and various aspects of psychological functioning. So that prediction is a no-brainer. Uh, more complicated predictions I can't make. Yeah. Do you think that's a fruitful sort of enterprise, the merger of? I'm, you know, I've always been a believer. And, you know, there are some people uh, who are by nature skeptics and other people who are by nature sort of believers and gullible. And, and I'm on... Uh, Amos was on the skeptical side very strongly, and I'm on the gullible side, so I tend to have enthusiasms and to believe that new things are going to be productive. So among my close friends, I'm the most enthusiastic about neuroeconomics and that sort of thing, but my, my close friends who are more Amos-like, uh, they, they need more proof. <laughs> We're presenting students with the cognitive reflection task and asking them to, we're giving them, which should be interesting, with 200,000 people <laughs> who are taking the course, uh, to see what the difference is um, between kind of fast and slow. Maybe we should mention the cognitive reflection task. Yeah, you, sh you can mention it. I mean, by the way, this, you know, you know that it was done by Shane Frederick. Uh, it, it, we actually had the bat and ball. He, he put the bat and ball example in a in an article that we wrote together. Yeah, that's, you know, my Nobel talk was based on uh, a paper that, that Shane and I had written together. So it extended that paper and the, the bat and ball was Shane's, one of Shane's many contributions to that work. Yeah. Do you think it's a reasonable, um, 
there's been a lot of work since the bat and the ball problem, trying to pin down exactly the nature of the differences. In the, look, uh, Keith Stanovich in particular has recently come up with demonstrations that, yes, it is related to sort of self-control and, uh, and to what he calls rationality. So he treats it as a, as a test of rationality. Uh, Shane is more ambivalent about whether this is very different from intelligence. And then there is a massively embarrassing result, uh, which is that there are gender differences and uh, that you know, nobody uh, wants to see. And nobody really believes that men are more rational than women. And, and yet men do better in that test than women by a lot. I mean, it's not a small effect. Now, my wife, Anne Treisman, is a well-known psychologist and a you know, national science medalist and all that, and she, she was completely uninterested in those puzzles. And she says she suspects that women are much less interested in, <laughs> in puzzles and much less competitive in that particular way. Then you know it looked trivial to her. She she wasn't going to put a lot of work into it, whereas I've you know I've always been one. You know, show me a puzzle and I'll go to work on it. So. <laughs> Fair enough. So what does success look like? In your book, you mentioned that you'd like to equip students with kind of the vocabulary and the jargon of of kind of judgment decision making to at least help them recognize when they might be in this minefield. Um, can you think of how? what success looks like in the end of this, of this pursuit? I mean, what would it for, look like? my, for what I was trying to do? Yeah. Uh, you know, success is always measured, I think, by whether you have changed the language. Yeah. And, you know, I was very explicit that changing the language was you know, the, the objective of it. And to a significant extent, you know, this has been successful. So system one and system two are now part of the language. Uh, to the dismay of you know, many psychologists who don't like this idea of systems as agents, and they would have liked to have type one and type two. But if I had tried type one and type two, they would not have become part of the language. So that's, you know, so success is new words. Is people who understand anchoring, who understand availability. Another word that uh, what you see is all there is. Is I mean, it has limited currency, but it has some currency. And so that's what success is like. It's really introducing terms that make it easier for people to see certain phenomena. So we're trying to figure out whether this course is successful. Um, and you've mentioned, for example, Keith Stanovich's uh, conception of the cognitive reflection task. So potentially seeing a change Obviously not in exactly the same questions, but at the beginning and the end. Uh, maybe a drop in belief in the paranormal. Um, maybe an increase in the cognitive um, sort of personality task to see the need for cognition or something. Uh, people want to think more or something at the end of the course. Can you think of another sort of benchmark that might help to gauge whether people um, are doing thinking more? I, you know, this... This is very ambitious, uh, what you're trying to do. <laughs> and, uh, and in a way, you know, to, of course, the way that one would want to structure a course to achieve that objective would require a lot of practice. And, uh, you know, so if ideally, you know, you'd want people to, uh, you'd want as an exercise, here is a mistake I made today, or here's a mistake I almost made today. So you'd want to make people introspective. But the easier, by far, task is to make people critical of other people. So if you improve, my thought has always been, you know, I've said that the aim of the book is to educate gossip, really. And, and that is because I believe that if you train people to be good critics of other people thinking and decision making, eventually they will turn that on themselves. But that this is the way, you know, this is the easiest way of doing it, uh, rather than uh, making people do something that is inherently quite aversive, which is monitor themselves and criticize themselves as they go along. My name is Danny. I think about thinking. Thank you.